Um, and you know, it's funny to see again to see this kind of this this similar rhetoric emerging where we look at what Putin did, um, you know, in Ukraine. We're like, is he crazy? Right? And it's like, <laughs> well, I mean, I just read like a, I just read like you know a six hundred page great biography of Putin by Philip Short. And one thing that struck me reading it is basically just how much of like a banal bureaucrat this guy is, mm. right? Um, you know, and what what he 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 really did was that you know he he again looking at NATO expansion, looking at the U.S. getting rid of nuclear proliferation treaties, right, which they did do, um, looking at the invasion of Libya, right, looking at what happened in Kosovo, right. Um, you know, he saw the way that that the West was acting toward Russia, and and again the lack of a, a rapprochement, and responded accordingly. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between so between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Comrade Hamilton is a, a, you know, a friend of Sublation. I like to call him our resident Stalinist. He's written for Sublation magazine. The article is called The Socialism of Shipwrecks. Um of Titanic and Triangle of Sadness. So why don't you summarize now um, your both, th two things. One, your critique of both of these films or your approach to understanding both these films, but and then also what both these films are and are about. You know, essentially uh, in the article I talk about the re-release of Titanic uh, this year, um, and, you know, I talk about the reception of Titanic when it first came out. I quote, like, Le Monde and the New York Times. Um, there was this tendency when Titanic first came out to, at least amongst sort of, you know, legacy media critics, um, to acclaim it as being a film which represented class struggle, right? And that had some sort of real left-wing credentials to it. Janet Maisel in the New York Times, um, she actually quoted James Cameron as saying, you know, um, and, you know, with the classes and everything in Titanic and the you know, you see all this Jack and Rose. She actually quoted um, uh, the film's director, James Cameron, is saying, uh, we're, we're stopping just short of Marx's dogma with this movie, which is itself a, kind of a fascinating quote. Uh, but what I point out is that in spite of that, it's kind of interesting that, um, and I make reference to the World Socialist website and Zizek and a few others, um, the reception of the film by Marxists, uh, you know, hasn't necessarily been overwhelmingly positive. <laughs> Right. I know Zizek talked about Cameron's sort of fake Hollywood Marxism, right? Particularly the idea that, uh, in a way, I think for Zizek, uh, the iceberg is really kind of the hero of the movie, right? Because this, you know, the disparity of the social classes means that this love could never really be properly consummated or realized, right? So it's uh, the iceberg performs a kind of uh, functional role of creating this tragedy that allows it to be enshrined in memory in this sort of perfection, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting because I guess the most influential, um, you know, opinion uh, or assessment of Titanic that was provided by anyone who could discernibly be called Marxist uh, was actually uh, Jiang Zemin, uh, the leader of China uh, in the 90s, de facto leader of China. And he famously gave this um, kind of endorsement of Titanic. Um, he said in a speech to the, um, uh, the People's Congress, uh, he said something like, this isn't filmmaking with $200 million. This is venture capitalism. But the story, the characters, the way the classes are represented. I encourage my comrades in the Politburo uh, to see this film. Um, I don't mean to endorse capitalism, uh, but as the saying goes, know thine enemy and you should fight a hundred battles without fear of defeat. <laughs> and I kind of, I, I try to situate uh, that quote a little bit because, you know, of course there were a lot of great filmmakers um, in China uh, in the 90s associated with the fifth generation. Maybe Zhang Yimou uh, is the most famous. Um, but, you know, a lot of these people made films that were really targeted at the international festival circuit, right? Uh, and they, you know, uh, because China didn't have enough cinemas, 
truly have a large domestic audience. Uh, so the films were quite self-consciously artistic in that way and uh, very influenced by social realism, right, sort of traditional um, left-wing aesthetic approaches um, and other things too. I, I don't mean to be reductive. Um, but, you know, I think what the, uh, you know, with commercially, uh, you know, the Chinese industry was in sort of a slump in that respect. Um, so I think really that their goal, and they had actually started bringing in foreign films starting in 1994, was to promote Titanic, to try to use the Titanic phenomena to drive uh, interest in, in cinema, right? Knowing that hopefully they could get to a point eventually where they would have enough uh, cinemas where they could have their own domestic industry. Um, and now that's actually come to pass. I mean, when Titanic launched um, in uh, 1998 in China, it launched in only 150 theaters. Um, I believe now there's like over 80,000 or something like that. And I know Titanic 3D launched over 13,000. Um, so there's been an absolutely remarkable uh, expansion of their industry, right? But it's interesting about these comments when they say like, you know, they were praiseful of the film, but they were also a little bit equivocal about it. So, you know, he says, I don't mean to endorse capitalism. A lot of Chinese organs, they kind of stepped in and tempered that endorsement. They said, well, the film is very lacking in a lot of ideological respects. And I think part of that has to do with the historical dimension uh, of Titanic itself, right? Because, you know, Zizek has talked about this sort of class dimension. Okay, Jack dies, and really it's just sort of, you know, allows Rose to develop a more well-rounded perspective, right? The sort of bourgeois person, right? There's this sort of class-loaded aspect to it. But I think for me that also functions on a historical level, right? Uh, so it's very interesting in the movie, you know, you have, if you remember, right, Rose is supposed to marry this guy, uh, Cal, right? He's like a Pittsburgh uh, magnet. Um, but it's very interesting in the film, like Cal, one of the first things we learn about him is he like, he hates the paintings of Picasso. Mm -hmm. uh, and later Rose is talking about Freud, you know, um, and he's very, very dismissive. Um, and I don't really think this is a coincidence, right? I mean, like you think of um, Freud as being labeled by the fascists as a promulgator of a kind of Jewish science or Picasso is creating degenerate art. I mean, what we have in this is we have Rose family and they're losing their fortune, right? So we've lost everything. All we have left is our name. Right? And the only person who can sort of save their family is this kind of um, it's sort of sniveling brute, right, Cal. And I, I think here we see, you know, really an allegory to the mid-century, right? You know, and the bourgeois was kind of in the state of collapse. Um, and there was the notion of the need for a kind of uh, unity with fascism in order to repress the left, uh, you know, and consolidate the status, right? Of course, Titanic actually sank in 1912. Yeah, it's, it's before, yeah, technically. Couldn't it just as well have been like the death of the old aristocracy as much as it was the uh, struggling of the bourgeoisie? I think those things are sort of connected, right? You know, um, like, you know, the, the, the bourgeoisie as we know it, right, was effectively sort of generated after World War II because of the fantastic destruction of capital, which occurred then, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it also demarcates the sort of transformation, right, um, between eras of ownership, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, but but you know then you have then you have uh, Jack right and Rose sort of rejects the idea of this union with Cal and she ends up working with Jack. Um, but I think it functions historically to the extent that you know Jack actually dies right like the working class kind of fails right um, you know but she says to him like I'll never let you go I'll never let you go right and so I think in a way this functions as a kind of origin story of like the Western progressive bourgeois you know popular front and so on right you know progressive bourgeois and, and working class kind of team up. Right, working class kind of collapses, but the progressive bourgeois shows us so we'll never we'll never forget your contribution, right? We've assimilated this progressive aspect, right? And at the end of the movie, we see that she goes on to live this life, and it is uh, sort of an affluent life, but it's also sort of emancipated. She's like she's not like you know stuck in this sort of constricting dress, you know, being you know auctioned off to different suitors. She's like you know riding an elephant and like flying a plane. Or something like that, right? mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I would take the whole the whole scene where Rose and Jack are on the the peak of the Titanic, you know, the famous scene there, right, where they're, you know, um, I would take that itself as a sort of metaphor for social flight. So, so I think this is interesting, but I think in a way, you know, this explains part of the discomfort because, you know, um, I mean, we could dispute history, but I, I think if we take this as an origin story of the Western progressive bourgeois, it's not really a, the story of China in the mid-century, right? Um, because what you saw, you know, in places like, um, Russia or China or Albania was a different kind of trajectory, right? It wasn't the case, like in France or Italy, that you had kind of working class, working with bourgeois and working class kind of collapses. Um, you actually had, you know, communist governments that uh, were formed, right? And that pushed through a series of fairly drastic uh, social transformations, right? Um, so this kind of brings me to the topic of um, 
a newer film, which I actually saw at Cannes uh, in 2022, uh, before it won, mm -hmm. um, Ruben Oslin's Struggle of Sadness. Um, and Ruben Oslin, you know, again, um, James Cameron said we're stopping just short of Marxist dogmas, which, you know, I think makes sense when you consider the way that the film is really a film about sort of the progressive bourgeois, but it incorporates this class of, sort of class analysis, right? Um, but Oslin is quite a bit more defiantly Marxist. Uh, he won the Palme d'Or for his film The Square. Um, but in an interview with the Irish Times he gave in 2018, um, you know, he discussed how uh, his mother was like a longtime member of the Swedish Communist Party um, mm -hmm. and how he had been greatly influenced by, um, you know, Marxist theories, uh, which he had an interest in. And also how he was frustrated with a lot of his critics, like how the French newspaper historically associated with uh, May 68, was founded by Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, Liberation. Uh, they accused his film *The Square* of being right-wing and very conservative, and he was saying it's like he's saying these, it's like these people want a sentimental picture of the poor, right? He's like, you know, I don't think that's really what Marx is about, right? I think Marx shows the way that you know um, poverty is a tragedy, right? You know, and also it, it engenders negative behaviors as well when you're exposed to living through this, right? Um, which which does seem like it could be a barb at Cameron, right? Because you know, in so many respects, *Titanic* is a very sentimental image. Uh, of poverty, right? You know, they're all doing the Gaelic dancing and everything. <laughs> it's, like, mm -hmm. um, it's quite romanticized. Um, but yeah, so so in Triangle of Sadness, for those who haven't seen it, um, it's about um, a couple, and it's about a male model, Carl, uh, an influencer, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, they get a sort of luxury cruise uh, gifted to them to help promote uh, the thing. Um, and then, you know, and it's filled with these really, really appalling sort of wealthy people, you know, and the woman says, like, clean the sails, you know, I want them to, I want you to clean the sails. And the person who works in the boat, they're like, we don't have sails. <laughs> you know, there are no sails in the boat. And the person's like, clean the sails. And they're like, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> like, um, but, um, you know, the boat eventually goes through this terrible storm. The rich are kind of belching and vomiting. Um, you have this debate that breaks out between a drunk um, Slatko Burek playing a Russian manure mogul uh, and Woody Harrelson playing the boat's captain, um, where they're sort of shouting at each other and Slatko Burek is defending, he's a Russian, he's right wing, he's defending Reagan. Um, and Woody Harrelson is like a kind of ultra left communist, you know? Um, he's mm -hmm. like, I'm a Marxist, not a communist. It doesn't have to be authoritarian, right? This kind of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, and so eventually the boat uh, goes through a storm, gets off course. Uh, it's capsized by African pirates. Um, and then some of the, the people on the boat, they wash up on this island. Um, and in that island, what quickly becomes apparent is that, like, you know, none of these wealthy people or, like, influencers or whatever have any fucking clue how to survive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's one woman, Abigail, who's basically the sort of Filipina maid. Um, and she's able to sort of produce resources to live, right? Mm -hmm. um, so she's, she's kind of nice. And, you know, she gives everyone enough food to live, provided they make an effort. And most of them are fairly useless. Um, you know, they overconsume rations, you know, they can barely kill like a donkey standing by idly, you know. Um, but she does start to appropriate certain privileges for herself. Uh, so, for example, she begins to sort of uh, extort sexual favors from, from Carl, who's like a male model, um, you know, in return for providing food. Um, you know, and she does create a, a sort of hierarchy. Um, and it's interesting, uh, just a, a, at the end of the movie, um, because, you know, obviously she enjoys a tremendously elevated status vis-a-vis -vis these people, this, this Philippine made in comparison with before. And at the end of the movie, she's out with um, Yaya, uh, the, the sort of beautiful influencer girlfriend of Carl, who's jealous of Abigail because they slept together. And Yaya discovers that the whole time they've been right beside this tourist resort, right in the Aegean, where they washed up. Um, so mm -hmm. they're going to find, the idea being they're going to get off this, right? And you see this wonderful image where Yaya is kind of looking off you know, into the sea, and she's saying, like, enjoy the moment, you know, and she's sort of making these kind of out-of-touch musings. She says, it's going to be great. She says, you know, when we get off this island, maybe you can be my assistant, right, uh, to Abigail. And then you see in the final scene, you see Abigail take this rock, <laughs> and she starts crying, right, while she's holding it, um, you know, and that's sort of where the movie leaves us, right? Mm. Um, and I, you know, reading this, I, I think it's very interesting to make the contrast between um, Titanic and Triangle of Sadness, um, because I think that whereas Titanic sort of shows us the uh, kind of, uh, you know, origin story of the progressive bourgeois, I think you could read Triangle of Sadness as kind of showing it from the other side, right? Uh, that is to say, um, you know, those sort of societies, um, 
you know, in which uh, there were these kind of socialist regimes which were created, right, particularly in the third world. Um, you know, but the nature of it was that because they existed in isolation from the larger capitalist economy, um, like the moment that world kind of um, poured in, it would be over. Right. So, we, you know, we have this history of these sort of repressive actions which are taken out of the sense of urgency. What would what would be over? But the idea that these socialist regimes would sort of collapse. They were but I mean, in, in Triangle of, of Sadness, the yeah. socialism is the top period where Abigail dominates everyone. Well, not, not, but, but like, again, we have to be careful about this, right? Because I think that, again, Austin's trying to perform a fairly nuanced critique. Um, it's interesting with the reception of Triangle of Sadness, um, mm -hmm. because on one hand, um, you know, people on the right have criticized as it, cr criticized it as like, oh, like another rich bashing film, you know, like White Lotus, you know, this kind of thing. I mean, this seems to be par for the course for critics, right? With, with like, don't look up or joke okay, or whatever. Okay, let's talk about White Lotus for a moment, because I've seen some of that. I saw, I've only seen a couple of episodes. I can't like I saw it. the beginning of that, but yeah. my, I, I thought it was fine, uh, White Lotus, but... Um, uh, my my problem with it as I start as I as it went along is that it promised me uh, all the enjoyment of a of a kind of a procedural or detective story you know like um, yeah. I was told oh there's a murder yeah, yeah yeah you know and so like the part of the enjoyment is trying to figure out who's going to be murdered and why yeah and then without any spoilers it turns out it isn't really a murder at all right yeah, and yeah. and um, <clears throat> and it really is just a social critique of the excesses of this particular, you know, the the international rich, uh, yeah, you know, the, yeah, the yeah. jet setters and the vacation getters. And yeah. um, and okay, like if I had known that's all it was, I wouldn't have watched it. Because yeah. I, I kind of already know, like, these people are studying. Like, fuck that. I want, fuck class criticism. <laughs> I want a procedural, damn it. Doug Lane, <laughs> right. Doug Lane streaming <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right. I, yeah, I want the pleasure of, of watching uh, someone solve a crime rather than no. just being told you something. Want the, you want the pleasure of bourgeois justice, yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Absolutely, Conrad. And I, this, is, this is important because I think the concept of bourgeois justice is a, prog is a, a full step up in the ladder of progress towards socialism than the concept of 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 uh, class revenge based on resentment smashing someone over the head with a rock yeah like, like that that is yeah. not that is not that may come out of um, in a moment yeah of revolution but that is not what what socialism is aimed at bourgeois justice is at the moment, the highest form of justice achievable in this world. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And anything that we try to do, uh, like, you know, some sort of communist version of justice without changing society at the root will just be a regression back into mob rule. Um, well, yeah, but, but, but those are, those are very, very important, you know, transitional, you know, it's like, if you look at the French revolution, like, um, democracy was not like a process whereby you went out and like, you know, put a, in this sort of impotent way, kind of put a ballot in a box, right? It was like something that was actually achieved through a kind of class terror. Like that was democracy. And I think really it's only because of, you know, the creation of bourgeois democracies that the notion of democracy becomes so inextricable from that. But just let me say, I want to say about, because you, you said the question, you said, well, you know, is it the case that, that communism is like Abigail dominating people? And I do find this very interesting, right? Because I said, if you look at the reception to Triangle of Sadness, right, um, on one side, you know, a lot of sort of uh, mainstream media critics, sort of liberal disposition have attacked the film. And I think you see this with a lot of, because now you've got this new genre of like left populist movies. I mentioned like Joker and Don't Look Up. Mm. Um, and they're always attacked invariably as being like unsubtle. You popular. think Don't Look Up is populist in some way? <laughs> <laughs> um, but go on. Uh, well, another another moment perhaps. But, mm. but I think... Um, you know, this is a sort of genre of critique, right? Um, and I think all these films kind of did better with, with audiences than they did with, with critics. Um, and even Triangle of Sadness, like, it didn't do that well with critics overall, but it won the Palme d'Or, so, you know. Mm. Um, but, um, uh, you know, so that was sort of the critique, I think, coming from kind of the liberal side. I think the critique on the leftist side was that, like, you know, it was a nihilistic film because it just shows, like, oh, power dynamics are going to reproduce. But I think we have to be careful about this because I think that, you know, if you look at the movie, it's like, 
you know, they live on this island, you know, like their status, their status is a relatively equalized. Abigail does help them live. I mean, sure, she appropriates a few privileges to herself, but it's a much more equal society from the sort of grotesque inequality that we see uh, previously, right? Um, so I don't think that Austin's point is to say like, well, this is perfect. I think he's actually trying to look at the difference between kind of actually existing socialism and capitalism as we have it while being very sober uh, about what the weaknesses of that are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I mean, that moment where she has the... the, the uh, in the first part of the movie, are people making Abigail give them sexual favors because of their class status over her? No, we don't see that, but we do actually, we do, what's interesting is that maybe in a subtler way, he does explore the way that class status actually mediates romantic encounters. So the first, like the first act in the movie, um, it shows a debate between Carl and Yaya uh, where, um, you know, she wants him to pay for dinner again. Um, and he's sort of reticent about it. And she's like, oh, this isn't sexy. You know, it's very straight couple kind of banal debate, <laughs> you know. Mm. Um, and then she later admits that she's only dating him in order to boost her Instagram followers. Um, so there are kind of allusions to that. But but I think this moment at the end, you know, where she has the the rock, um, you know, and she's debating what to do. And I think it's very, it's much more powerful, like, to not show what she's going to do than it would be mm -hmm. to show it, right? Um, mm. But I think, um, you know, in a way, it's like if you were to look at, <clears throat> these moments in the history of um, <clears throat> actually existing socialism, right? Like if we talk about, um, you know, the Trotsky's massacre of like the left of Lenin sailors at Kronstadt or uh, Tiananmen Square, right? Um, you know, it's like this, this, I think really what it shows you is a kind of trauma, right? Where it's like this kind of point of no return um, where you realize that it's like, well, we're going to kill now or we're probably going to fail. Right? And that's, that's already the result of certain failures, right? You know, obviously, uh, Abigail failed to, you know, mediate the situation with, with Carl and Yaya adequately. Um, and there's this sort of external risk, uh, which is going to Yeah, tender. killing Yaya will not actually hold her power in place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? She's not going to be able to hold on to the, the kind of socialism she had created on the island after killing it. Yaya. She's just, it's just a... Yeah impotent act of violence there at the end. Am I right in reading? I haven't well, seen I don't, it. I don't think it's necessarily completely impotent, but, but because, you know, it's like China, the PRC still exists, right? Uh, like the Soviet Union existed long after Kronstadt. Well, I'm just talking about Abigail here. Oh, I'm yeah. yeah. So, about... <laughs> but, well, I'm, I'm trying to draw a parallel. So it's interesting the right. movie because one thing I don't mention that's maybe important is that at the end of the movie, um, you know, as you see her making that choice, you also see Carl running through the forest. And it's as if, like, they left together uh, Yaya and Abigail, and of course there was this tension because Yaya was jealous that, um, you know, Carl was, was sleeping with Abigail. Um, and it's as if he has this kind of eureka where he realizes the danger she's in, right, by virtue of being mm -hmm. alone with her, outside the mm -hmm. context of knowing about this resort or anything, and he starts sprinting through the woods. So, of course, he raises the question, like, is he just going to arrive there, you know, and see her dead and see the resort? You know, we don't know, right? Right. Then she'll have to kill him with the rock. Yeah, and then, then Columbo like, will be sent in to figure out who did it. <laughs> well, and then and then she'll have no one to she'll, she won't have like this handsome you know Instagram stuff to you know extract sexual favors from. So that would be a loss for her as well. Um, so uh, you know, but but I think again, like I think both of these critiques, like to call the film, you know, if you call the film simply like an anti-rich movie, it's like you miss the fact that you know the society that's established by Abigail is not without its own problems, right? You know, it's not a utopia. Right. On the other yeah. hand, if you if you say of Triangle of Sadness that um, uh, that it's um, that it, it doesn't give a real alternative because it doesn't show like, you know, a true utopia or something. I think you miss the point that what he's he's not trying to show a sort of messianic moment where we achieve this kind of perfect society. What he's actually trying to do is show, you know, again, sort of actually existing socialism, as I read it, and the real problems that it faced. Right. As a kind of social formation. So, I, you know, I say at one point. I think it's more useful to look at what the film does rather than what it doesn't, right? And I think a lot of people have been projecting um, in that respect. But again, but so I think we, we have this very, very interesting contrast, right, between in both these films by directors who claim to have some kind of relationship with Marxism, right? Um, different, but some kind of relationship. Both uh, films that, um, you know, use sort of a boat as a microcosm of society. And many critics were quick to compare... Um, you know, Triangle of Sadness with Titanic, even if Ferrari's Grand Booth is maybe uh, the more apt comparison. 
Um, but I think, you know, it kind of shows that the, the films sort of, the films sort of show us this from, from different sides, right? On one hand, we have a kind of origin story of the Western progressive bourgeois. I think on the other hand, we have a version of the 20th century um, that shows us more the actual trajectory of, of socialist regimes, as it were, right? I, I just find the idea, I mean, I find it really interesting to map on the embrace of the popular front by the left uh, in the, in, you know, when faced with the fascist threat, to map that onto to Titanic and uh, the 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 way in which the uh, what was it? What's the the woman's name? Rose. The way Rose, Rose yeah. is, is con confronted by uh, the prospect of marrying. Uh, uh, How could you forget that? You just watched this movie right before this interview, right? For no. Oh, right. Exactly. <laughs> I Rose, made that Rose false do, name. Rose do it, Pekaker, by the way. <laughs> um, but what was and it was and it, the name of the uh, her suitor was what again? Carl? No, that's Cal. That Carl Cal. is strong with that. Cal. It's Cal. Yeah, Cal, yeah. Cal. So, I I just I never saw Cal as anything other than, you know, a, a fairly conservative, uh, rich man, you know, at, at around the turn of the century, rather than, like a he didn't. There, was how, there, how, there far that, that, how far is that from fascism to start? <laughs> like, it's like, um, I don't know. That's a good question. Like, is mm -hmm. fascism really a conservative mm -hmm. movement in the sense of does is it infused with the uh, norms and values of what I think of as um, turn of the century? Uh, European bourgeois values. I mean, which I don't know if those are, if my understanding is even sure. particularly correct, but. But he's but, different um, than the other people in the boat because, you know, he's a lot, he, in a way, he's a lot more malevolent. Um, I mentioned not just sort of criticizing these kind of, you know, Freud and Well, but what is he, point, what are we point, told you know, that they, he does? Like, well, how does he get, is he new rich or is he from an old wealthy family? It says it's like, I think it's like Pittsburgh Steel. I'd have to double check. Um, but it's Pittsburgh, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's American. Point, so sure, there's yeah. that. That's a strike against him right there. Right? <laughs> well, at one point he says they're talking about they're talking about the boat, um, you know, and he has this sort of invincible faith that the boat will, uh, you know, not sink. Um, but at one point um, he's, uh, you know, they talk about, uh, you know, the people who, the people who die, you know, if the boat sank, right? Uh, you know, half the people in the boat could die, right? Um, and he says, well, not the better half, right? Um, so he has this very malevolent. Um, kind of side, which I think differentiates him, you know, from some of the other rich who are just sort of aloof, you know, and arrogant. Right. No, he's he's an outright class antagonist. Yeah. For yeah. sure. He mm -hmm. he does outright express a feeling of contempt for the passengers who are ben literally beneath him mm -hmm. on the boat. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's true. Um, uh, but. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I kind of, I, I, I feel as though the fascist m movements were, um, were not uh, so quick to embrace kind of old forms of caste distinction, and were more concerned about class collaboration mm -hmm. and a feeling of a, a, a people based around nationality or ethnicity, or mm -hmm. usually both, and that it was a um, that it had to do with uh, empowering the state in a national mythos and not yep. so much about, um, you know, the, the embracing the old aristocracy or the, or the notions well, was, of the old aristocracy. But it was dependent on that, that legitimization at every step. Like, I do agree the ideology is different. But, like, if you look at um, the March on Rome by Mussolini, right, this ultimately led to the King of Italy, right, you know, kind of sanctioning fascism as being, uh, you know, uh, a, a needed alternative to the possibility of left takeover. Right, um, and you see that that same kind of um, dynamic being being uh, reproduced all over. I mean, there was all kinds of conservative royalists in France who supported Pétain, for example. So it it had its own contours ideologically, um, mm -hmm. as does Cal. Um, but you know, I think the idea here is that, that I think the idea here is that he is newer money than Rose family, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that he, that that what he really sees in them is the possibility of legitimizing himself, right? Um, mm -hmm. Right, being more than like a rich thug or something. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. And and so right. Um, and what right. And so the 
turn towards the working class as a way to protect yourself against the cows of the world, um, I guess that does could be thought of as mapping onto the popular front. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, and, and she's, you know, they both try to save each other. Like, she saves him when he's, he's handcuffed and she takes the axe. You know, the movie's incredible. I watched the movie twice when it came out again in 4K. It's incredible, right? It grips mm -hmm. you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, as a commercial piece of, piece of filmmaking, <clears throat> it's quite remarkable. Um, but also one thing that's really interesting about this is that, um, you know, if you, there's this whole thing around, uh, the, so the heart of the ocean, right? It's this mm -hmm. necklace that uh, Cal um, gives to Rose, right? To try to kind of woo her over. Um, and it's this uh, diamond uh, that was supposedly worn by uh, Louis the Sixteenth. Um, and then around the time of um, his uh, execution in 1793, uh, by the Jacobins, uh, it, w it went missing, um, and then it was supposed to be recut, right? I mean, it's this massively valuable diamond that Cal's also searching for uh, as the ship goes down. Um, but it ends up Cal puts it in in Rose's uh, jacket, and of course she sort of absconds at the end, and she ends up leaving with it. But what's interesting is that that she never uses the diamond, right? And she even says at one point she says, "Oh, I didn't like wearing it that much. It was like a dreadful, heavy thing," right? Mm -hmm. Um, and at the end of the movie, we see the scene where she drops the diamond in the ocean, kind of giving it back. And I really take, take this diamond, right, which, is, which was worn by Louis XVI before his execution, um, as being a symbol of kind of like, her, like heritable wealth and aristocratic reaction, right? Um, sort of excess wealth that has nothing to do with your personal achievement. And I think in a way, you know, I don't think Titanic is really anti-capitalist. I think it's, it's anti-aristocratic. Um, in a way, right? Like the idea mm -hmm. that your status should be so disconnected from your personal accomplishment, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in, in a way, um, you know, I think her getting rid of it at the end of the movie, it's a symbol of the idea that we, we can never we can never go back to this, right? Mm -hmm. you know, we should never go back to this uh, uh, laudatory assessment of heritable wealth or mm -hmm. um, so on and so on. So I, I think that's structurally important. I mean, I think, um, and I actually thought it was funny because apparently, you know, <clears throat> when the at the Academy Awards, Celine Dion, she wore a, a version of that. That she, <laughs> she, so I thought she probably is not aware of this this angle, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. Um. Actually, there was a, you know, there's an alternative ending because the original ending of Titanic, uh, when she goes to drop the thing uh, off the, because you know, in, in the movie they have this frame narrative with her, she's old, and there's like mm -hmm. this right. guy, and he's like, he's like, he's like, for what he says, he's like, for five years I was obsessed with Titanic, you know, this kind of thing, like. Um, but uh, there was the, originally in the ending, because you have these characters, like she brings her niece or daughter or something, and then there's this, this guy who's like a treasure hunter, um, what's his name, like Brock Garrett or something, who's looking for... Um, but in the, original, in the ending, the original ending, she goes to drop the thing off the boat, the diamond, and then she's confronted by all the characters, <laughs> like the, the, the treasure hunters. Um, and one of them, it's a terrible scene, like you can see why they cut it. One of them, he runs up to her after she drops in the water. He goes, that really sucks, lady. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, apparently they played this ending. They test, test, they did test screenings. They did this ending and everyone just laughed. <laughs> so <they> just laughed. <laughs> but it leads to a bit of incoherency in the frame narrative. Because like some of the characters, you don't really know whether they're there. Um, uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, but, but, but yeah, and I think, I do think it's interesting. Um, I think it's interesting, uh, the link with China, too. Because, like, there's a weird... I mentioned before that um, Jiang Zemin, mm -hmm. you know, kind of endorsed the film. Um, uh, and, um, you know, he... Um, it's kind of interesting how he did that because, you know, it's important to remember that, you know, um, a lot of directors who are using social realist elements like Zhang Yimou were actually, you know, they were supported by the Chinese government because they wanted to create like festival films and kind of bring prestige to themselves. Um, but uh, they were also uh, subject to censure, right? So several of, of, of Zhang Yimou's films were, um, uh, were banned, right? Um, I think uh, To Live, right? And uh, Raise the Red Lantern, which is widely considered to be sort of a critical allegory of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but it's kind of interesting, like, uh, because when, um, actually, there's a, there are a couple essays I used to help develop my research in the China angle, and one of them is by Jonathan Noble. Um, and, um, you know, it sort of deals with the paradox of sort of the Chinese Communist Party endorsing this big commercial event, 
like Titanic. Um, but uh, one of the things he notes is that when Zhang Zemin actually talks about Titanic, uh, he channels the language of um, Mao's talks on arts and literature at the Yunnan Forum, right? Mao's most notable uh, sort of lecture on culture. And in a way, the message of Jiang Ziman, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite an interesting to turn them all. Uh, in a way, now Titanic was the first film that had ever been endorsed by the Chinese Communist Party, right? Um, which is quite mm -hmm. striking. Um, but in a way, by endorsing Titanic, he was also issuing a de facto reproach to domestic filmmakers, right? Um, you know, because mm -hmm. Mao says, you know, <clears throat> you have to understand the people when you make art, right? Like a lot of artists are very aloof. You have to really get in that culture and understand popular, popular behavior and, under, and you know, and in a way, um, it's kind of a deter deterrent of all where Jiang is kind of saying like, well, because you couldn't understand the people, you couldn't make Titanic. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. like, so it's a weird way to sort of wield that against social realism, right? And, and of course, now we know <clears throat> in China that, um, uh, you know, now we have, we have all these movies, you know, like uh, Wolf Warrior 2 and um, uh, Battle of Lake Changjian about the Korean War and these kind of things. Um, you know, and, and social realism really is not the thing, right? Like these are not, you know, realistic examinations of material conditions. Um, you know, whatever, however, um, you know, good or not good they are, right? Um, they've certainly leaned toward the spectacular, you know, uh, in the search of market expansion, right? What did Mao mean when he told artists to understand the people? Like, what, what was he, was he, um, cause today, if, People who would argue that uh, artists or like Hollywood filmmakers are out of touch with the people are often conservatives, mm -hmm. right? Oh, Hollywood's way too woke. It has this agenda about strong female characters or ethnic diversity or I don't know, I don't know, we got yada, 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 whatever it happens to be. And, it, and what people really want what the people want is to be entertained. What the people want is a good story. What pe the people yeah. want is a police procedural procedural, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so, uh, how did Mao think of understanding or being in touch with or one with the people? Um, yeah. how, as opposed to and and was that less reactionary when it was coming from Mao than it would be coming from uh, Steven Crowder today. Okay, okay. Well, I, well, I would certainly hope so. Um, but, um, you know, again, probably the remarks, like, I'm not an expert in, like, every facet of, of Chinese mm -hmm. culture and literature and so on. Um, you know, I can talk a little more, bit, bit more about cinema. Um, but um, probably uh, what he's really getting at is the fact that, you know, class stratification is so extreme uh, in China at that time. And of course, um, going back to his uh, famous text on the peasant movement in Yunnan, he had sort of, because, you know, it's important to remember about Mao how crazy he is, right? Um, like, you know, in, in, in kind of a, quite a genius in a way too, right? Because, you know, in 1927, he writes this text, right? Um, you know, saying, well, you know, look, I've seen the peasants, they're rising up. You know, they can be the basis of revolution. And like the Chinese Communist Party actually thought he was insane. Right, uh, and that wasn't aided by the fact that he couldn't read a lot of the Marxist class, classes, class, uh, classics. He didn't know European languages, and they were ready to expel him from the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party for advocating, you know, um, heretical views. Until Chiang Kai-shek him massacred all the European communists, and then Mao was like, "Okay, we're going to go out and form a mountain base." Right, and they were like, "Okay, <laughs> not really in a position to disagree." <laughs> like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, and by the way, quick mention to a wonderful book that was just published uh, on the historical materialism book series of Brill, uh, Mao Zedong Thought by Wang Fangji, who was a Chinese Trotskyist, who was actually uh, uh, persecuted by Mao, um, but very, very sober uh, and even-handed assessment of that legacy. And he ultimately concludes that Maoist thought has three sources, um, kind of neo-Confucian thought, Marxism, and also sort of Wuxia bandit folk stories, you know, but people would kind of steal from the rich and give to the poor. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's a bit of a digression, but I just want to say that I think that it's important to understand that probably Mao's great advantage, right, as it turned out, was that he wasn't so uh, urban and cosmopolitan, right? He came from, like, I think a wealthy farming family, 
Um, so, you know, he had enough time to kind of read and develop himself, but he wasn't someone who was really well-versed in European languages, not necessarily that familiar with urban culture. I think he went to, like, a, an English language engineering school or something for, like, a week, and mm. then he dropped out because he's like, fuck this, I don't know this bullshit. <laughs> like, um, you know, whereas Deng Xiaoping was in Paris, right, um, at the time. Um, but uh, I think that his real advantage was he was able to see the society from a different side, right? You know, he didn't become... Uh, totally transfixed uh, in this this theme of urban revolution, and Wang Fangji will point out that, you know, <clears throat> in, in certain ways that was also a disadvantage because you know the Chinese Communist Party was very good at finding a way to enact revolution, but it also led to long term perversions kind of in the doctrine because it was coming out of kind of rural impulses, right? Mm. But I think in a way when he talks about this, you know, you got to understand like it's actually hard for us to grasp how stratified a society like that would be in terms of classes, in terms of literacy. Um, you know, we take for granted in the West that like, you know, <clears throat> often that that language is something, like when you watch historical films, like everyone speaks basically English or if it's French, it's like French. Um, I mean, at the time of the French Revolution, only 25% of people spoke French, right? You know, that was kind of imposed mm -hmm. from- And the rest, the rest of them spoke English. <laughs> That's right. There, exactly, because everybody speaks English in the in the, in the zone of nullity. Um, no, they had all kinds of, of dialects, um, and it was much the same uh, in China, right? Because you know what we call Chinese is really like the um, Peking, Beijing mm. dialect, and even Mao had trouble with the tones because he was from Hunan, right? Mm. Um, so you know, and even the writing system, like it's like it was like almost art, you know, to do. Um, so I think, you know, what he's really stressing is the need to recognize those extreme stratifications um, and the need to acknowledge them and, you know, acknowledge the possibility of an enlarged audience when you actually create your work, right? Now, what's always interesting about this, of course, is that, you know, when it comes to Jiang Zemin, uh, what's interesting, again, is that <clears throat> we might, you know, you, you talk about Lukash and social realism and this kind of thing, and, you know, uh, we might... Um, recognize that, that that injunction to understand the people, um, you know, you, you know, there's a tension sometimes between that um, and the uh, stylistic approaches which are traditionally advocated, or there can be between that and the stylistic approaches which are traditionally advocated by socialists. Um, you know, and that's in a way what Jiang Zemin kind of exploited, right? Um, you know, his point was like, you know, um, you know, and I, I, I'm taking it, he doesn't literally say this, but I think his basic idea is like, look, if we keep making just like these festival films and being caught in this vicious cycle, like we don't have enough cinemas to make commercial films. Um, you know, our films aren't creating enough interest to build more cinemas. Um, if we remain stuck in this vicious uh, cycle, um, we're just going to get bulldozed by Hollywood, like in the context of any kind of economic opening up. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it was taken as necessary that there had to be an effort to, um, you know, emulate certain kinds of, of Hollywood techniques if they really wanted to get to a point where they could have a, a, a successful domestic industry, right? And now, actually, it's interesting because I, I mentioned, like, Wolf Warrior Two and Battle of Lake Changjin. Um, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right, but anyway, uh, who cares? Um, you know, with Chinese and English, just, this is not going, right? Um, but uh, I think that um, those are interesting because those are both, like, very nationalist movies, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm. Wolf Warrior Two is about uh, a... Um, a uh, Chinese former military mercenary stationed in Africa. And then there's like a coup launched against the government that's like aided by the US. Um, and he has to intervene to like save the domestic government. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a scene at the end where, uh, you know, he's, he's the Africans, he's saved there and you see them on their truck and he holds up, you know, the, the Chinese flag, you know, and it's kind of, uh, you know, um, <laughs> it's going to be, you know, blowing in the wind. Right, it's this whole, whole like he's just hoisting it above everyone, and then there's like a, a message at the end by the, and it's like the Chinese government will protect all its citizens no matter where you go, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, battle, battle like Chen Jin, of course, is about China's last major military altercation, which was when, and Mao was initially reluctant, but that was when um, they intervened in the Korean War, because um, General MacArthur, um, you know, had made this successful advance, because of course the U.S. kind of inherited the Japanese colonial territories after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. And um, they were fighting communist guerrillas and they'd made a, a successful advance to the North. Then China started to panic. They're like, we don't want this U.S. puppet state like on our border. So they, they rushed in by surprise and kind of uh, actually did battle with the U.S. and seized a lot of their equipment. So again, uh, it's also very, very nationalist uh, in character. Right. We've come to the end of the first half.
If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>